a displaced couple who have nowhere to turn. We will journey with starving shepherds who long for things to change. We will journey with wise astronomers who travel far and wide looking for a new beginning. We will join them all as they journey toward the light. In the name of the one who is born this night, Jesus Christ Emmanuel, the light of the world, welcome. My name is Murray Spear. My personal pronouns are he and him, and I'm privileged to be the minister at Wild Rose United Church. With me in the sanctuary for this service are uh, Dan Somerville, Diane McKenzie, and Navone McIntosh, who are supporting us musically, as well as Dora DeLulo Patton and Laura DeLulo, who are sharing readings, as well as uh, part of the opening liturgy, and Gordon Plaxton, who is sharing a reading, and also Linda Ellis, who will be leading our hymns and taking part in part of the opening liturgy, and uh, Corinne Salajano and uh, Don McIntosh who are supporting us with our uh, tech needs. This year is different in many ways. So along with the worship committee, I'm pleased to offer a worship experience rather than just a worship service. This experience will include everything I was told people expect on Christmas Eve. So you can imagine it will turn out to be rather long. But fear not, as the shepherds will say a bit, or the shepherds will hear a bit later. The video you're now streaming is split into sections for easy navigation. Want to see a piece here and there? You have that option. Want to watch some now and pick up easily where you left off? That's pretty simple too. Want to skip over some bits? Please feel free. In the description on the YouTube video, you'll see a series of links that will take you to different parts of the experience. Another way that this year is different is that this video will go live after sunset on the 24th, but for us here in the sanctuary, it is high noon on uh, the winter solstice. So you'll see uh, some sunlight streaming through our south window. We are all actively imagining that it is after sunset, and uh, I invite you who are watching to do the same. One part of the experience is communion. Holy communion is normally done with bread and either wine or grape juice. Here in the sanctuary, each of us will partake in whatever we have brought with us. Where you are, you can participate with whatever you have on hand. Crackers or cookies or bread or muffins or granola, grape juice or wine or apple cider or tea or hot chocolate. If you choose to participate in the communion portion of the service, I invite you to have those things ready in advance. As we gather, we acknowledge that wherever we stand, we are on the traditional territory of the Indigenous peoples of Canada. And we affirm our commitment to respect the history, spirituality, and culture of the First Peoples of this land, particularly in our case, the peoples of Treaty 7, made up of the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising the Kainai, Pikani, and Siksika First Nations, the Tsutina First Nation, and the three nations of the Stony Nakoda, Wesley, Bearspaw, and Chiniki. And Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta Zone 3. We are all treaty people, and we all have work to do in reconciling and healing the broken relationships of centuries. Oh, Lord. 
invite you to join me in the opening words based on Isaiah 9 verses 2 to 6. As always during the service, please join in on the words bolded in yellow. The people who walked in darkness now see a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light is shining. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us, Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Strength of God, Eternal Protector, Prince of Peace. And now I invite Dora DeLua Patton and Laura DeLulu to come up and do our wreath lighting. We've been preparing for this night for the last four weeks. Finally, the Christmas season has arrived. On the first Sunday of Advent, we heard that the one we've been waiting for is the child of Adam. We lit the first candle to remind us that Christ was human first. On the second Sunday of Advent, we heard that the one we've been waiting for is the child of God. We lit the second candle to remind us that Christ was fully holy. On the third Sunday of Advent, we heard that the one we have been waiting for is the child of Mary. We lit the third candle to remind us that Christ was one with the poor and downtrodden. On the fourth Sunday of Advent, we heard that the one we have been waiting for is the child of David. We lit the fourth candle to remind us that Christ is part of God's long heritage. Now Christmas is here. The sun has set, and once again the Christ child is born among us. Tonight, we light the candle at the center of the wreath. We will hear that Jesus was born far away from the centers of influence to parents displaced and oppressed by kings and emperors. Tonight, we proclaim that the night long ago, that on the night, that night long ago, the center of the world was in the small town of Bethlehem and that Christ is at the center of all things, now and forever. We light this candle as a symbol that a child is born who will, light, who will be a light to the whole world and that God is with us. Light, life, and love in the form of a child.
on this midwinter's night, O Holy One. Your song reaches us over the hills. The hills of Galilee, the hills of home, the hills of fear and mistrust. Your song is a harmony composed of hope, compassion, and joy, of repentance, patience, and awareness. It is sung in all tongues and throughout all time and space. Tonight we sing for all those who are searching for a word of encouragement and renewal. We sing in defiance of all that leaves us cold, empty, or overshadowed. We sing so that the birth of goodness and warmth all around us will not go unheralded, but will spread with peace and justice so that the song goes on and on. Amen. This concludes the first portion of our worship experience. Part two of our worship experience is a service of hymns and readings. We begin with, O Come All Ye Faithful. of Jesus' birth, according to Matthew, goes like this. Now the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she discovered she was pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being an upright man and reluctant to humiliate her in public, decided to end the engagement quietly. This was his plan when suddenly a divine messenger appeared in a dream and said, Joseph, heir to the house of David, do not be afraid to wed Mary, for the child she carries is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save the people from all sin. All this took place to give full meaning to the divine words of the prophet. Look, a young woman shall conceive and bear a son, 
and they shall call him Emmanuel. When Joseph woke up, he did as the divine messenger had instructed him. He married her, but did not go to bed with her until she gave birth to a son, and he named him Jesus. The story of Jesus' birth, according to Luke, goes like this. In those days, Caesar Augustus ordered a census of the whole Roman world. All the people went to the towns of their birth to be counted. One of them was Joseph, who, who went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to the city of David called Bethlehem in Judea because he was part of a house and family descended from David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in pieces of cloth and laid him in a feeding trough because there was no place for them in the inn. Not far from Bethlehem, some sheep herders were living in the fields keeping watch over their flock by night. Then a divine messenger stood in front of them, and a divine light shone gloriously around them, and they were terrified. But the messenger said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. Today a Savior is born to you in the city of David. This is the divine Messiah. This is what you will look for. Seek a child wrapped in pieces of cloth lying in a feeding trough. Suddenly, a great number of divine servants stood with the messenger and praised God, saying, Glory to God who is above all things, and peace among God's favored ones on earth. When the divine messenger had left them, the sheep herder said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem right now and see for ourselves what has happened. They hurried and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the feeding trough. When they saw this, they shared what they had been told about the child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the sheep herders told them. Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The sheep herders returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, which was just as they had been told. This concludes the second part of our experience. What follows is a special short film produced by our Kids Zone coordinator, Corinne Salajano, and featuring the families of our Kids Zone members. What are you doing? Washing my socks. But why? Well, 
I'm a shepherd in its night. You've heard the song. Which song? Well, shepherds wash their socks by night. That's not what this song is about. You're supposed to be watching your flock like me. Did you hear that? What? I thought I heard. You sure do. We both heard. What? Sheep. Behold. Okay, I definitely heard something. Oh, look, an incoming call. Do not be afraid. Don't be afraid. That's a weird thing to say at the start of a video call. Like, I wasn't afraid until you said that. But now I, I'm, a, I, a, I'm a little anxious. There's supposed to be a bright light and a scary voice saying, Behold, then I say, do not be afraid. You're right. I'm getting a little anxious, too. I bring you good news of great joy to all people. Um, I think maybe you clicked the wrong profile. Like, if you want your news to go viral, maybe you should be using YouTube or TikTok instead of video chat. The only ones here are sheep. I heard that. You heard sheep? Yeah, I do. What? <laughs> what did they say? <laughs> if you want to get lots of views, you should try a different app. No, you do not understand. I am an angel. Wow, no self-esteem issues for you, are there? No, an actual angel. I was told to contact you with a message. Hey, that's what I heard. Sheep? No, behold. Behold sheep? Listen, behold, I bring you good news of great joy for all people. Unto you today is born in the city of David a savior. He talks funny. He is Christ the Lord. Him? No, he isn't. He's just a shepherd like me. I think she means the baby. Yeah, I mean the baby. He is Christ the Lord. You know him because he was swaddled and laid in a manger. What? No crib for a bed? Oh, that's all? Did you know how... Do you know how many social media accounts there are in Bethlehem? This could take us all night. Some of us have socks to wash, you know. Find them and tell them what you've heard. She? Hold on, we're getting another call. Glory to God above all and peace on earth among those whom God favors. It got very strange very quickly. Come on, I have an idea. We'll find the baby as quickly as we can, tell them we heard sheep, and then get get back to our laundry. I don't think we're supposed to tell him we heard sheep. I think we're supposed to tell him we heard an angel. How can you heard one angel? That's stupid. Come on, we have a lot of profiles to sort through. So you're going to get responsive with a Facebook post like that? Of course, I joined the Bethlehem Lost and Found group. It's surprisingly active right now. Almost like a whole bunch of people have surprisingly no have traveled to Bethlehem from all over. Probably for the holidays. The what? Oh, people are joining the conferences that we set up. Excuse me, ma'am. Do you have information about a baby in the manger? I came here to tell you not to feed your baby to an animal, you weirdo. No, no, you don't understand. Somewhere in town right now, there's a baby in a manger, and we have to tell him that we heard. Sheep. So you are a weirdo. I don't know of any babies in mangers. Hey, we heard about a baby, didn't we? Yeah, a baby. Yes. Who was born? Yes. And put in a basket. A basket? You're sure it wasn't a manger? Definitely a basket. No crib for a bed. You know, at least that's what we heard. 
You heard? I heard. Heard what? Sheep. You heard sheep? Yep. What did they say? Uh, we heard the the baby born and put in a manger is the Savior, Christ the Lord. Good news of great joy to all people. Sorry, I only heard about the basket baby. Are you the ones looking for the baby in the wood in a wood scuttle? Wood scuttle? What are you talking about? We're looking for a baby in a manger. Well, I heard that there is a baby on the other side of town who was born and put into a wood scuttle. No crib for a bed and all that. Where did you hear that? On some website or another. It's hard to say. It's hard to keep track of sources these days. Well, have you heard anything about a baby in a manger? No, I can't say I heard that. Why are you so focused on a ma on the manger baby? Every baby matters. It's because of what we heard. Cheap. No, we heard an angel say that the baby born and put in a manger is Christ the Lord, Savior, good news of great joy for the world. Well, that seems unlikely. What do you mean? Well, first of all, an angel wouldn't talk to people like you. <laughs> you can't be influencers. You aren't even wearing socks. Second of all, shouldn't the Christ be born in a palace or a temple? I'm not sure I could believe in a Christ who, who was put in a wood scuttle. He was put in a manger. Look, I'm only telling you what I heard. No, it's I guess we'll have to start calling stables directly and asking if there are any babies in there. Behold. Hello, is this Bethlehem in stables? Yes, you're looking for a place to sleep. We have a lot of people here already, but there's room for more. No, we've been calling all around town looking for a baby. The, there's a baby here. My wife just gave birth in the stable. Let me guess, you put him in a basket? Actually, no. A wood scuttle? No, we had him put in a manger. There was no crib for a bed. We've been searching everywhere for the baby who is born and put in a manger because we're supposed to tell him what we heard. We heard sheep. You heard sheep? Yeah. What did they say? We were watching our flocks by night when a divine messenger told us good news of great joy for all people. Behold, unto you today is born in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Wow, you remembered all that? Yep. I wasn't even sure you were you heard. I definitely heard. So we called around to find you and tell you what we heard. This night just got very strange very quickly. Tell me about it. I know, right? I'm not even wearing socks. Well, my wife is resting now, but I'll sure she, she'll want to hear all about it. We named, uh, and you can meet the baby, we named him Jesus. I'll go, I'll go get them. I can't believe we found the baby in a manger at last. They named him Jesus? If he's Christ the Lord, he's going to be called Jesus Christ a lot. It sounds funny. What would you have named him? I don't know, something really grand like Magafo, Optimus Prime, Chris. But everything happened just as we... We're told it. it must be true, and we were the first ones to hear about it. Just a couple of dummies on an ordinary night, and now everybody everywhere is going to hear what we heard. Yep, yes they are. Let's go get ready to see the baby. We now begin the fourth part of our worship experience, which includes more hymns and readings, as well as a brief message from me.
I want to invite you, if you will, to think of a small heartbreak you felt. Maybe recently or maybe longer ago that it's resolved and no longer troubling to you. I'll give you an example. Recently, my father was at our house uh, after the, the birth of our, of our new baby, and he was doing some organizing in our garage. He tried to pick up my almost brand new Black & Decker workbench and move it. But he grabbed it by a piece that comes off, and he dropped it. One of the adjustable crank handles that move the two parts of the table together and apart snapped in the fall. How could I respond? Could I be angry? No, because he was doing his best to help us. Could I be vengeful, insisting that he restore what was broken? No, because he's my father. And how many times have I carelessly or inadvertently damaged something that belongs to him and that was even cherished to him? The only appropriate response in this case is a tiny bit of heartbreak. I wonder if you can think of a similar small heartbreak that you've felt. We all, every one of us, have experiences of heartbreak. Some more than others, some greater than others, some more recent than others, but it is something that we all share. Some of us have undoubtedly have, uh, have had feelings of heartbreak in recent days and weeks as our cherished holiday traditions have to be altered due to pandemic restrictions. Some of us may have recently, or not so recently, endured nigh unbearable loss. Others may have faced tremendous uncertainty. Regardless, heartbreak is an aspect of our shared humanity. We are accustomed, I think, most of us, to gathering for Christmas as a time of rejoicing and celebration. But it hasn't always been that way. One of our most beloved popular holiday songs, I'll Be Home for Christmas, was written, in fact, about being apart. About being unable to be home for Christmas. During the hard times in the first half of the 20th century, we often wished for what we couldn't have, a warm gathering in the arms of beloved family. Many of us likely know tales, recent or not so recent, of, uh, of family holiday seasons when there was togetherness but little rejoicing due to hunger or loss or cold or illness. I think if we really try, if we really cast our minds back, every one of us can remember at least one Christmas in, in our personal past or in our family's recent past that is tinged by heartbreak. The people in our stories this morning, as much as the rejoicing is emphasized, are no strangers to this shared human experience. A young woman facing an uncertain future. A young man thrust into fatherhood. Shepherds who are economically vulnerable during a time of tremendous economic upheaval. Wise visitors who we'll hear about uh, in just a couple of minutes, who, are, uh, who come from a distant land and unexpectedly find themselves in the crosshairs of a jealous and vengeful ruler named Herod. What varies from one person to another is not the experience of heartbreak, which is universal, but our response to it. King Herod, raised as 
the heir of a powerful ruling family, undoubtedly, doubtless, endured unimaginable heartbreak to turn him into the tyrant he became. And lest we assume that he is simply conveniently cast in the role of villain in the Bible, we know from reliable histories that he was a jealous and ruthless ruler, executing and assassinating his uncles, his brothers, his own children when they presented any opposition to his power. What must he have undergone in order to respond in such a way? It is our pain and our response to it in many ways that shapes us into who we are. Whether we run from it or face it, whether we explore its depths or plaster it over, whether we allow it to control us or allow it to inform us. Our pain is sometimes our closest friend and our best protected possession. We can become so attached to our pain that we let it divert us and prevent us from forming other attachments. We can keep our pain wrapped so close to our hearts that nothing else is able to approach. The miracle of Christmas is not that the people in the story lived free of pain and heartbreak. They did not. That's not why they're able to celebrate. The miracle of Christmas is that the people in the story are able to celebrate despite their tremendous broken hearts. That through all of their pain, they were able to welcome light and life and love in the form of a child. That their burden of pain did not prevent them from recognizing God's presence and God's action. The faith of Christmas is likewise not about living free from heartbreak. We are not exempt from the cruelties of chaos and illness, of human fragility and cruelty, of frustrated hope and disappointed hearts. Our faith does not do that, and we cannot escape the pain that threatens to overwhelm, much as we might wish to. We live in a world just as real as that inhabited by the people in our gospel stories. Our faith is characterized by our response to heartbreak. Whether we allow it to break us open, make us open-hearted people, and increase our capacity for joy and compassion and hope, or whether we allow that pain to break us down, make us small-hearted people with hearts hardened to the suffering of others. Into the world broken by pain and uncertainty and fear, God pours God's self in an eternal offering of light and life and love. Today we celebrate that outpouring in the form of a child, exceptional not in his immunity to suffering, but in his endurance of it. Born to a family and a community, not free of heartbreak, but with the capacity to rejoice in the midst of it. This is the gift and the miracle of Christmas. We will be together again. We can endure what is facing us. We can allow our hearts to be broken open and discover there a new ability to love and forgive and rejoice. May it always be so.
Sometime after these things, during the reign of King Herod, wise astronomers from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is the child who was born King of Judea? For we observed the star in the eastern sky and have come to show him honor. When Herod heard this, he was afraid of losing his power and everyone in Jerusalem was afraid of his reaction. He asked his experts where the Messiah was to be born and they told him it was in Bethlehem. Herod met with the wise astronomers privately and asked them when they had first seen the star. He sent them from Bethlehem saying, search carefully for the child and report back to me once you have found him so that I may go and honor him. They went and saw the star they had observed was now ahead of them and they journeyed eastward to Bethlehem. They walked toward it until it appeared to stop over the place where the child was. When they saw where it was, they stopped. They were overwhelmed with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with Mary, his mother. They knelt down, showed him honor. Then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. They had been told in a dream not to go back to Herod in Jerusalem. So they returned to their home country by a different road. After the wise astronomers left, a divine message appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Joseph, stand up, take the child and your wife and flee to Egypt. Stay there as long as I say, because King Herod is going to search for your child and kill him. Joseph arose and before the night had ended, they had departed for Egypt. They stayed there until Herod's death. This gave full meaning to the divine words of the prophet Hosea. I have called my heir out of Egypt. Five of our experience includes the offering, a hymn, and a special slideshow of an experience that the Kids Zone had earlier in the autumn. Among the gifts that are shared today, whether perched under shining evergreen trees or tucked in socks or stockings or mailboxes or transmitted as bites of ones and zeros, let us also bring gifts from our treasure stores for the sake of the ongoing work of Christ in the world as we dedicate our tithes and offerings to God.
Let us pray. Infinite God, in the deepest night there rises the star of morning, the star of birth, the herald of a new day you are making, a day of great joy. Dawning in faint shafts of light and love, we hear whispers of peace in the stillness, fresh breezes of new promise, winter sparrows chirping of life, a baby's cry of need and hope we hear whispers of Christmas. In the darkness, we see the light. We find in it comfort, confidence, and a cause for celebration, for the darkness cannot overcome it. And we rejoice to nourish it in ourselves, in other people and in the world, for the sake of him in whom it was born and in whom it shines forever, Jesus the Christ, born to us tonight. In the sacrament of communion, the ordinary things of life, water, bread, and wine, point beyond themselves to God and God's love, teaching us to be alert to the sacred in the midst of life. This is not the table of Wild Rose United Church or the United Church of Canada or even the worldwide church. It is Christ's table, and all are welcome at the table of the Lord. Holy Communion is normally done with either wine or grape juice, here in the sanctuary, we will each partake of what we have brought with us. Uh, in my case, grape juice and uh, some tree-shaped Christmas shortbread. Where you are, you can participate with whatever you have on hand. Crackers, cookies, muffins, bread, granola. Grape juice, wine, apple juice, tea, hot chocolate, apple cider. If you choose to participate, I invite you to have those things ready now. Come, not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Not because you are blessed, but because you are hungry. Come because you know God a little, and you want to know God more. God is present in the act of communion. And throughout the, the prayer, I invite you to join in the portions printed in yellow. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to all. Let us open our hearts we open them to God and to each other. Let us give thanks to God. It is good to give thanks and praise. Let us pray. Blessed are you, God of majesty and mystery. From the dawn of creation to the fulfillment of all time, you seek us out. We thank you that your word has found us in flesh, the divine Jesus Emmanuel. 
We praise you for your revelation in stable warmth and birthing cry, in humility and in glory. We bless you for this good news of great joy, and we join with angels singing and shepherds rejoicing to proclaim your praise. Holy, holy, holy God, power of life and love, all of creation is awash in your glorious light. Hosanna through the ages. Blessed is the one who brings your compassion to the earth. Hosanna through the ages. When that child had grown older and danger was all around, he sat at table with his friends on the night before he was to die. He took bread, gave thanks, opened the bread, and offered it to his friends and said, Take, eat, remember me. Then he took the cup and said, Take, drink, remember. We remember Christ. Born a simple peasant in the tiny town of Bethlehem, raised up by you to glory in all places. By sharing in this loaf and cup, we retell Christ's birth, remember Christ's life, proclaim Christ's death, celebrate Christ's resurrection, and await Christ's coming anew. We pray you, God of love, send your Holy Spirit upon us and what we do here, that, these, that we and these gifts touched by your Spirit may be signs of life and love to each other and to all the world. At this time, we also remember all those who are in need of our love in this blessed season. We pray for all who are in sorrow or in pain, all who are ill or alone, all who live with fear, oppression, or hunger, all whom the world counts as last and least. We pray for your church and its varied ministries, for the nations as they strive for peace and justice, for the earth and the fragile web of life we share, for our families and friends. Help us to love as Christ loved. Knowing our own weakness, may we stand with all who stumble. Sharing in his suffering, may we remember all who suffer. Held in his love, may we embrace all who the world denies. Rejoicing in his grace, may we forgive with grace all who do wrong to us. We praise you, eternal God, through Christ, the light of the world, and in the power of your life-giving spirit, now and forever. Amen. We gather these and all our prayers, thankful that we may turn to you as to a grandmother who watches over us and pray together as Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now, let's all hold in our hand our bread or substitute, ready to partake together. Jesus Christ, the bread of life. Amen. Now let's all hold in our hand our juice, wine, or other drink ready to partake together. Jesus Christ, the cup of blessing. Amen. Would you join me in the prayer after communion? Wondrous God, we have been touched by the holy through this shared meal in the presence of Christ. May what we have received strengthen us so that, like Mary, we may have the courage to birth your love in the world. May our joy be contagious like the shepherds who were invited to the stable door. Like those witnesses of old, may we seek to follow the light. Use our lives to bless this world that you love. This Christmas season and all year long, 
make our lives shine with hope, peace, joy, and love that is your gift in Jesus the Christ. Amen. This concludes part six of our worship experience. This is the final portion of our experience. One of the enduring traditions of many church congregations on Christmas Eve is to dim the lights and pass a light between us. We aren't together this evening, but we will be together again. We are dimming the lights here in the sanctuary, and I invite you, uh, wherever you are, to make the lighting low, and if you have a candle, to light it now. Hear these words from the beginning of John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was with God in the beginning. Everything that exists, exists through the Word, and nothing exists without the Word. What exists through the Word is life, and the life is a light for all people. A light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it, the true light that shines for all people was coming into the world.
may we go into the world as those whose feet walk paths of peace, whose voices sing songs of hope, and whose hands do work of compassionate love. And may the blessing of God who makes us, God who heals us, and God who sustains us be given and shared among you and throughout the world, tonight and forevermore.